I mean, he's got a gait, the way he walks. He's had a moustache. <laughs> he's got a bald head. He wore a bonnet. Everywhere he went, you know, he had his hat on, his bonnet. Somebody just gave him the moniker, the bonnet. So it's because he was always wearing a cap. He's the only person I met in this whole time that had a plan. It's only part of the story, but maybe it's the only the part that you want to hear. A team under pressure, a board divided. Fans say there's a crisis at Paradise. My name is Stephen McGowan. Around about the time of 1993, I was in my first journalistic job with the Weekly News in Glasgow. By the early 1990s, Celtic were going nowhere fast. We had Rangers under David Murray, spending big money and going to four or five in a row. Celtic's last trophy had come in 1989, and there was an air of decay around the club, on and off the pitch. For Celtic fans used to success, it's been very hard to take that their team are once again also runs. Reports of the club's mounting debt, millions needed to build a new stadium, and a bitter power struggle in the Celtic boardroom. My name is David Lowe. I was an investment manager in the city. I had two passions in life. One was music, one was Celtic. In the 1980s, money had come into the game for the first time. Celtic didn't have that. The board were cheap skates. So I noticed that and wasn't very happy, obviously. The club had been in the possession of three families, really. The Kellys, the Whites and the Grants. We'd almost become a kind of dynasty who just passed the club down from generation to generation. They didn't really like each other, but what bound them together was Celtic and the status that they had at Celtic. There was just this, this kind of feeling that they would never spend money if they could possibly avoid it. It was like this urban myth about Celtic that their money was kept in a biscuit turned under the bed by one of the directors. I and others, you know, would go to the board and say, you know, you need help, but they didn't want to know. In the last month, a new fanzine has been published, critical of the Celtic board. My name is Matt McGlone. I was writing a fanzine called Once a Tim, Always a Tim. Once a Tim, Celtic fanzine! My idea with the fanzine was to try and uh, give the supporters a voice. I was at a supporters function. Somebody said to me, you're Matt McGlone, you do the Celtic fanzine. Did you know that Celtic possibly couldn't pay their bills? Celtic is in serious financial trouble, millions of pounds in debt, and in need of cash to refurbish the ageing Parkhead Stadium. Well, if we can't pay our bills, what happens to the club? A club which had been the kings of Europe in the relatively recent past now were regressing at quite a rate. There was all sorts of schemes being brought about that uh, a new stadium would be built at Cambus Lang. Cambus Lang is a reality to transform this football club. Now, this is a horrifying thought. The club's historic roots have always been in the east end of Glasgow. It's part of their DNA, it's who they are. That was our main concern for the fans, to stop that from happening. I put an advert in the newspaper and I said, if you care about the welfare of your club, turn up at the city halls tomorrow night. And this was Celts for change. Celts for change was loud, which was vocal, which was organised. We support Lou McCarry, we support the team 100%. We don't support that board, we want them out. They are no good, they're not healthy for Celtic. We knew that to save the club, things had to change. Everybody would vent their frustrations and everybody would castigate the board. But so what? You've got to have a plan for changing things. I was an investment manager. My job was to ascertain what companies were good to invest in. Is there any evidence that people outside of Celtic are trying to buy Celtic shares. I think there are always businessmen, entrepreneurs, supporters wanting to buy shares in the club. I believe that that's the case at the present time. Fergus McCann was described to me as a slightly eccentric, very determined guy, Celtic fan from Canada, and I should go and meet him. I went to Montreal and his first words to me were, who are you and what do you want? So I, I thought, oh, that's brilliant. A guy who is straight to the point. Fergus McCann was quite a peculiar figure. 
He didn't look like the traditional footballing saviour. The only person I met in this whole time that had a plan was Fergus McCann and the fans' sledge support for this plan. We didn't have any money. You know, all we could use was the tool of being fans. But the fans had the spirit, the tenacity, the drive, the will to win and to save the club from going under. I mean, you've really had supporters going to Celtic Park with the, the kind of equivalent at the time of pitchforks and, 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 and flamethrowers. And making life incredibly uncomfortable for the people who were running the club. And of course, the bank's watching this. Suddenly, they're interested and the bank forced the issue. We want repaid now. I don't think it can be any understating just how much danger Celtic were in. The bank had effectively said, you have by midday on Friday or else the club is finished. To have no Celtic is unthinkable, but we knew it could happen. They want a million pounds with 48 hours or they're going to call in the receivers. So I called up Fergus McCann, who was playing golf in Phoenix, Arizona at the time. And I said, you better get your ass over here, Fergus. <laughs> Fergus McCann had arrived at Glasgow Airport, confident, but giving nothing away. They wanted the money by 12 noon, otherwise it was going to go bust. We went up to the bank, signed the forms, and that, I remember looking at uh, my watch. It was 11.52. That was the first time I really thought, there's an end game here. The press knows something's going down. Everybody sort of knows there's going to be a change in the dynamic. But at that stage, all that's happened is that Fergus has replaced the bank as the guy that's owed money in an insolvent company. And he's not on the board. His borders on reckless to just put money in without any due diligence. It's a basically, it's a blind bet. So having sorted the bank out, you then go up to Celtic Park and you've got, got to basically come to an agreement with the board members about buying their shares. I was standing outside Celtic Park at six in the morning and I stayed there till about, I think it was probably just before 11 o'clock at night. It's a game of poker going on here. We know that the game's up. It's just a matter of money now, how much. So you agree a price and the deal is done. I always remember on the way out, Fergus said to Michael Kelly, Goodbye, Mr. Kelly. I hope I never meet you again. The game is over. The Rebels have won. No! It was just utter elation. Here was a fans' movement which had helped win the day. The end of an era at Celtic. Buoyant Rebels take control. We have new people, a new plan, a new vision, and the strength to go forward. The real impetus for change came from the supporters to almost create this kind of perfect storm of resistance, which in the end effectively hounded the Celtic board out of office. I'm just a, a small part. It was a huge uh, effort by so many. And so when somebody comes out and says the game is over, the rebels have won, you know, who's not going to cheer? <laughs> so everybody cheers, but you know, this was the easy bit. You <laughs> know, what do we do next? I think he'd un underestimated the media, the bitching, the backbite, the fighting, the double dealing and the emotion. I remember the next day, looking out at the office with McCann, you know, going like, what do we do now? <laughs> He's bought himself a £5 million problem. <laughs>